everyone. My name is Pajani Patha, and I'm the chair of AXO, the Association of African Exhibition Organizers. Thank you so much for listening in to our Agile Leadership Series. In our efforts to educate, inspire, and lead the way, we have been interviewing the leaders of our exhibition industry. So today, I'm joined by Charles Wilson, who's the CEO of Gallagher Convention Center. Charles has been an integral part of the Gallagher Convention Center team for 11 years now. He started at Gallagher as the general manager of operations and was later promoted to the position of general manager. Now the expertise that Charles brings to Gallagher Convention Center is invaluable and has ensured stability for the Gallagher team and the company's valued clients. He has been at the head of many projects to refurbish the 32 hectare Gallagher Convention Center property and he reaffirms the company's commitment to reinvesting in the property's facilities. So thank you so much for joining us today, Charles. We, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. It's such a pleasure to reconnect with you. I know you and I chatted earlier this year and um, it's wonderful to be able to get a chance to keep in touch and just keep seeing where everybody is at right now. Well, thank you for having me here. Yeah. So my first question to you, and I know you and I have chatted about this uh, earlier, but um, it's interesting as the year goes, how things, how we, our perceptions change and things as well. But what would you say has been your greatest challenge during the crisis at Gallagher Convention Center? I think, you know, as you know, when we had our last discussion, I think, you know, one of the things um, from Gallagher's point of view that we put a lot of um, emphasis on is our relationship with our staff and our staff's relationship with our clients. And I think one of the biggest challenges I've had personally in my role, but also the rest of my Exco team is you need to keep your team motivated. You know, when we initially, when I had to make the first announcement, when our president called for the hard lockdown, I mean, I stood in front of my team and I said, you know what, we're going to go through this lockdown. I don't think it's going to be for long. Here we're sitting 200 plus days and we have no different story. You have nothing else to tell them. And I mean, we keep the lines of communication open to them and, you know, you try and motivate them and try and talk to them. And from Gallagher's point of view, we're still looking after them as much as we humanly possibly can. But, you know, you also know that it's only going to be a matter of time where certain staff members are going to need to move on purely out of necessity, not because they want to. And I think that's one of the biggest risks for anyone in our industry is we're going to lose so much talent in the next few months. If, if the situation doesn't change, if the caps on our ability to do business doesn't change, we are going to lose so much of what makes us who we are in, in the service industry and what makes us as special as we are. And I'm not talking about just the management and stuff. I'm talking about every staff member from the carpenter right down to the banqueting manager. You know, we, we're going to lose that talent because... They're not going to find jobs in the hospitality industry in South Africa. They're going to diversify and we're going to lose years and years of experience. Yeah, that is so true. I think that is this one of the saddest parts of this entire situation. The people that make up this industry. And uh, like you said, there's been so much talent that we have nurtured over the past yeah. many years that many, most of us have been in the industry and to see that uh, you know, being left on the side and, and not having an opportunity to grow even further to take these people onto their next level of their journey is really sad. But thankfully to leaders like yourselves, you know, we, you have made an attempt to nurture as long as you can, but I agree with the situation as it is, there comes a point in time where there is no more that you can do as much yeah. as you're trying to. But I know that you and, 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 and we've seen Gallagher um, make lots of effort in many different ways. But what would you say that you have done, your organization has done in the past few months that makes you really proud? Well, you know, it, it's, we take every opportunity that we have, um, even the smallest opportunity. Um, when the um, government lifted the liquor sales ban and we, we you know, the, the minister of... Um, what was it? I think it was corporate government said that you know on uh, on consumption licenses are allowed to sell off con. We opened a liquor store, you know. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't successful, but it was an opportunity for some of my staff members, at least, to earn some income for two weeks because we tried it for two weeks. We put it through the mills, we dotted all the eyes and crossed all the T's, and unfortunately, it wasn't successful. But for those two weeks, those guys were paid money that they wouldn't have earned any other way. The, the thing that makes me the proudest is the fact that it was one phone call 
you know, to my guys to say, you know what, I need guys to be cashiers. I had operations managers, I had banqueting managers standing there as cashiers. You know, just the ability to earn. I'm in a situation now where we recently opened a small coffee shop in one, in, in one of the office buildings which we own, and I brought in um, my, all my banqueting staff, you know, on rotation, the receptionist on rotation, just to work behind the, the counters. I mean, so that we look after the guys that look after us. And it, it makes me proud being able to know that I can push on anybody's button within that company. Most of our clients would know this. I mean, at Gallagher, we don't say no unless it's illegal. And even then it, it's a maybe, I'm joking. So it's always a no when it's illegal. <laughs> but, you know, just the ability to tell the staff, you know, what, there's an opportunity. You're going to earn far less than you normally do, but just come in. And not one person said no. You know, next morning they were there. Coffee shop was built within two days. We were operational on the third day. It's still running now. It's just, you know, it's a very small component of our business, but everybody is just pitching in. So again, it comes back to, you know, just being able to stand and look at a team that says, we'll do anything. Whatever it takes to make Gallagher successful, we'll do it. But I have to say that's kudos to you because, you know, for you to be able to call on your team members and for them to respond in that way just shows that your leadership over the past few years has allowed you to do that. The type of relationships you've established with your staff has allowed you to do that because not all staff would respond like that under different leadership. Yeah. Um, and I think also, you know, what you're saying is in terms of what Gallagher has done, um, is inspirational actually, whether it has worked or hasn't worked, um, just show, gives you know other businesses in our industry an idea of how we need to start thinking out the box, right? Yeah. Um, because we're so used to this is what we're doing, but in times like this, um, it's time to think outside the box, right? Absolutely, I mean, you're looking at a situation where our industry well, you know, I'm talking from a venue point of view, but, you know, to a certain extent, some of the organizers as well, you, you pigeonhole yourself for very many years because you, you bake a cake, the recipe is successful, why change the recipe, all right? So you're constantly doing that. Then all of a sudden, someone switches the oven off. How are you going to do business? Now, all of a sudden, it's, it's yes, as much as it's about thinking outside the box, but you're in a position now that there, quite honestly, is no box, all right? You've just got to either diversify your business completely find another avenue that you know utilizes your expertise or ultimately be in a position where you sit back and say you know what i give up and we're not those people i don't think anybody in our industry are those people i mean i think the one thing that everybody in our industry has in common is this absolute dedication to what we do and it's a dedication to excellence i mean and it's not just gallagher i mean it's the, it's the organizers we work with i mean we most of us are extremely temperamental people i mean most of us are very unforgiving to how we expect things to be done but that's a testament to our passion for what we believe in so all we have to do is take that passion which still exists it's not gone all right and just move it a little bit to the left a little bit to the right because the sense is not there anymore you know and even if by some miracle government decides to lift the lockdown tomorrow and state of disaster comes to an end and all of a sudden all the caps on the venues are lifted, it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be the same for years because damage has been done. The damage over the last seven, eight months is going to take years to come right. So you are going to have to diversify whether you want to or not because putting yourself in a cocoon and thinking you're going to come out like a butterfly, it's not going to happen. That's the reality of our business. Yep, and, and the situation has forced us to think in this way. And I mean, you know, being an organizer or being in the eventing space, you need to be able to think on your feet. And let's hope that that stands most people in the industry in good stead, because, you know, you're constantly thrown into situations and you need to know how to respond, can respond quickly. So yeah. we sincerely hope that most businesses would be able to take on that kind of thinking. But I mean, we know that it's been an emotional struggle for the country as a whole. Uh, and we can only hope that people learn from your words as well and, and other leaders in our industry. And as they look forward to 2021 and, and the years ahead, uh, obviously the entire environment is going to be changing. Um, what steps has Gallagher taken um, to start encouraging organizers or to show organizers and hold their hands, maybe a partner with them, uh, on how to create a safe environment for the, the exhibitors and the visitors and the attendees to the shows? I th yeah, I think it's 
it's it's a very simple question to answer in that government has given us a lot of guidelines as to what they will and what they won't accept. I mean, we've been lucky that we've hosted in the, in the last couple of weeks, we've hosted a few events. We've actually hosted an event which we now classify as large, 320 people. And, you know, you were put in a position that you, you, you put yourself in a position like you're the, you're the visitor to that show. What would make you feel at ease? And then you just turn the table because now you're responsible for that person. All right, I am that person. What would make me at ease? So what we did is simple. We put up screening stations with the clients. You know, we worked with the organizer. We said we put out screening stations prior to people entering the venue, the social distancing. We looked at the standard setups isn't what they were anymore. It's not the cinema styles and the herring bones and, you know, those types of the schoolroom styles. It's now completely changed. As much as it is similar, it's just much larger. So your, your capacities change. And you make sure that when an individual sits on a chair, you know, they are safe because they are going to be there for eight, nine hours listening in a conference in a confined space, you know. So we've got sanitizers all over the place. Um, we've got hand sanitizers. We've changed the chemicals which we use in our facilities as well. So all of our chemicals in our toilet facilities are antibacterial. Um, it's got the 70% alcohol and all of those things. It's the sanitizers, the venue entrances, the temperature screenings. and But the biggest thing, in, and, and I've got to really repeat what our president said is we need to remember that we're all responsible for ourselves as well you know so as much as the onus is on us as a venue which we take extremely seriously and we comply and we go the extra mile and everything we also rely on the delegates and the visitor to actually just take a bit of responsibility for yourself as well because it is your health wear your mask all right it's not yes i can enforce wearing the mask by saying if you don't wear the mask i'm not, you know not in, allow you into the venue but once you're in the venue you know, do I really want to go out and embarrass you by walking up to a person and saying, you know what, please put on your mask or alternatively, if you don't, we, we are going to have to take steps against you. You know, you don't want to ever be in that position. And as an organizer, you know that you don't ever want to take a hard stance to a delegate. Sometimes you need to, you know, nudge them in the right direction, but do it respectfully and do it with, you know, so that they understand. We can put up 50 million posters if we want to. We can hand a poster to every person, but that does not mean that individual will comply. All right. Compliance comes when the whole group complies. And to make the whole group comply, just make it easy, comfortable. It's it's not fun. I mean, none of us like wearing masks, all right? Specifically when you're sitting inside a venue, you're sitting there for nine hours with a mask on your face. I mean, I've got the utmost respect for cashiers at shops, you know, because quite honestly, I wouldn't be able to do that, all right? I'm, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that when I'm in my office, I don't wear my mask. When someone enters my office, then obviously you do the responsible thing and you put a mask on and you do these things. But we, uh, we give people the opportunity and the tools to look after themselves. And I think that's the most important thing from a venue point of view that we can do, you know, much more than that you can't do. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I mean, it, it is tough circumstances, but I think you're responding well to it. And I think you and your team are working closely together. And I think that's important, making sure. But again, as you said, you know, you, your team are very committed and there's obviously you're all working together in this, but now you have these teams that are really dedicated. You're providing all these solutions. Um, what advice would you give to other venue operators on partnering with uh, event organizers that are preparing to relaunch? You know, how can they work together? You know what? It's. I think sometimes. I mean, we you had the situation in our industry where. It's almost an us and them scenario, the venue and the organizer. And I mean, in my last discussion with you, I also highlighted my concerns where that is. And I think the, the best advice I can tell a venue operator is when you speak to your organizer, make sure the organizer understand that I'm not, I'm, as much as I'm a service provider to you, I'm part of your team, all right? Because if I don't provide the service which I committed to on the standard that I know I'm either known for or that you expect from me, your event's not gonna be a success. You know, my venue is still going to be there tomorrow, albeit with a bad reputation, but you're not going to be a success. But when you sit with an organizer and you explain to an organizer, you know what, I'm not, it's, it's not about putting your foot, kicking your heels in and saying, you're responsible for this and you're responsible for that. But because let's face it, we're both responsible because as much as you're bringing the, the, the guests to our venue, I'm providing the venue to your guests. All right. So we're both responsible and we've got to both find a very amicable way of doing this. We've gone as far as I've just signed off this morning buying uh, an additional three foggers where we will be fogging our own venues. 
purely to bring the cost component down because the venue cannot bear all those costs. It, it, it will make it quite impossible to do business considering the square metrics we talk about. So you look at a shared cost component or reducing the cost by insourcing your own equipment, you know, and it's not really that expensive. Um, so all you have to do is just work with your organizer. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. And that's the best advice I can give a, a venue operator. Don't put yourself on a pedestal and don't, as an organizer, don't be on a pedestal. You know, what? because yeah. if you've got this animosity between an, a venue organizer, a venue operator and an organizer, you're not going to have a successful event because everything will go wrong because you're inviting it towards yourself. Absolutely. And I think right now, given the circumstances, there's even more need to work together than ever before, no, uh, and, which is wonderful. Uh, and, and maybe it's time to re so that organizers and venues can look at that together. It's a joint project. It's mutually beneficial for the longevity of the event as well. Now, you know, a lot of event organizers are seeing that everything is starting to change and we talk about just 2021 for now you know like you said uh you know if you're in a conference setting and there's the seating is apart and wearing masks and those kind of things so obviously the environment in, within the exhibition and, and conferences um are going to change how long do you think this might go on for or do you think the repercussions of these changes will be long going and and, and do you think that um you know this would affect uh, or this would ensure that we have the hybrid events will start staying with us for a longer period what are your thoughts on that i think you know it's it's it's, it's a very broad question when you when you look at it like that i mean how how long is this going to last for it's it's impossible to tell um I, th I think we, we you look at you look at two things which you've got to look at Frina, from a business point of view the damage that's done now all right so a business such as Gallagher. So the damage has been done for seven months. We haven't traded. So for seven months worth of trade is gone. In that seven months, you've managed to utilize most of the reserves or if not all of the reserves that you've built up through very many years. So in essence, you're starting a new business. The moment the cap is lifted on venues or the cap is made more reasonable on venues, you know what, you are, you're going to basically start all, all over again. You've got to reintegrate your staff. But let's face it, you can't just now tomorrow, if the president talks to us tonight and now tomorrow, you know, but open your venue and bring all your staff back because it's unaffordable. So you're looking at a systematic approach to reintroducing your staff to your venue to the point that your venue reaches capacity. It's not going to happen in the next six months. It's, you know, in my opinion, I think it's going to take a year, maybe two for the venues to get to the point where we post 2019 or close to 2019 is to... In, as to how we're going to be operating. Once you've got that going, then you've got to look at the events themselves. You know, you're looking at con consumer confidence. Is the consumer, is the visitor, is the trade visitor going to get in his car and drive to a venue, all right? And if the risk of COVID is still hanging over their heads. And even if COVID is long gone and the, and the miracle vaccine is found and everybody is happiness and joy, you're still going to deal with that paranoia in the market because from a consumer show point of view, are you going to put your family in that position that you now are between amongst a huge crowd? From a trade point of view, are you going to instruct your employees to go to shows now? All right. So it's again got to do with what the international trends are going to be, what the local trends are going to be, what the spikes and the lows and the highs are going to be, whether a person is actually going to visit a show. I see a lot of co-location of shows coming. So now I have to start piggybacking on one set of visitors, even though it's, if it's in a similar market, you know, from a trade show point of view, consumer shows will obviously never co-locate because it's too competitive. But um, the hybrid shows will definitely, they're going to be here to stay. Uh, I'm, I'm not anti-technology. I'm actually, on the contrary, very pro-technology. But I don't think the South African market is ready for Zoom meetings forever and a day. I don't see that. I see the conference market do pick up. I see it. It's, and we can actually see it, strangely enough, we can start seeing it with some of the in, uh, inquiries that we're getting for early next year towards the middle part of next year. We're getting more the big inquiries. Um, you know, so you, you almost get that sense like people just, oh, let's just go away. But that's going to form such a small part of our business that it, it's not going to be put us in a position that makes our business sustainable. So the short answer to your question is, we, we've got years worth of damage that we've got to deal with, you know. The long answer to your question is your business is going to have to be spread up between what you provide and who's going to visit your event 
And, you know, and when I say my event, it's quite honestly because we are the partner of the organizer. All right, it is our event. So getting, getting yeah. to, to that point, because we're not going to see the revenue figures we've seen for the last few years. We're not going to see it for the next few years until we get to the point where this mass hysteria is going to calm down to a cup final, you know. I like that. So between my phone and your dog barking in the background, I'm, I'm sure we've got it all. <laughs> oh. <laughs> my 600 but, kilogram little dog. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, but that's all right, because that's the way Zoom meetings go. Yeah. And, and, and you, you're so right, you know, as much as we can continue doing this um, and, and the hybrid events uh, will might help in you know in certain ways in terms of maybe it's cost effective but it, it still cannot beat that face to face of having that speaker right there in front of you right even though you can zoom him in um and, and the audience is there but i might as well just sit at home and watch him on my computer we are we are, we are tactile beings i mean that's just the way we are and especially specifically south africans i mean I've been overseas and I've, I've visited some of the international con convention centers and you almost get like the standoffish feeling when you walk a show and stuff like that. South Africans are very diff different, you know, it's just the way we interact, you know, it's, it's just different. And w you cannot keep us in these four walls and this roof and then say, do business, you know, um, because you we are I mean, systematically going to go insane. You know, yeah. we need that talking. We're a social people. We, we completely are. I mean, I just love, I miss traveling, I think, so much because, and, but, but when you travel, I don't know if you agree, but on the way back home and on you on the plane and you've been surrounded by foreigners during this entire trip and then on the way back home when you're standing in the queue to board the plane and yeah. you start hearing these South African accents and the South African warmth and you, before they even talk, you know that they're from home, right? Yeah. <laughs> My, my wife is absolutely one of those people. She could quite honestly speak to anybody. I mean, seriously, I mean, I've, I've said to her on a few occasions, all right, you need to really stop. We've just stopped for milk, you know. <laughs> you really don't need the person behind the counter's bio, you know. You don't need that. Or the person standing behind you. I mean, she's like a true reflection of a, of a South African. Because she, she just talks to any person that, you know, she feels like because that's her way of, you know, interacting. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not that person. You know, I, I'm sociable up to a point, but I don't just start talking to strangers. I think people would just think I'm psycho if I do. But you know, she just gets away with it. Well, on that note, talking about the home front, amidst all of this that is happening, how do you look after yourself from a personal well-being point of view? You know, I, I heard the dog in the background. I'm assuming you take him for walks regularly, or is that not your job? No, no, my I've got I've got two beautiful dogs. Um, I've got a husky that's crossed with an albino German shepherd, uh, and if you see the animal, you know he's an absolute beast. But he despises a leash, so he doesn't like going outside. Then I've got a, a Labrador crossed with a Chow that if a gate opens down the street, he's out it. You know, so I've got a, a nice mishmash of that. I spend a lot of time with my son. I mean, I do, I've, I've, you know, especially during the lockdown, I do a lot of steel work. I enjoy working with steel. It's, it's my happy space. Um, and my son as well, he spends quite a lot of time in the workshop with me. We've got a proper workshop where we do steel work and we build stuff which we don't generally need, but you know, you build it. Um, my wife got to a point where she said, seven brizes is enough now. So find something else to build. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, she, she finds it strange as well, but I think it's when you've got so much noise around you, you you actually relax, you know, because you, you you don't have that quiet time. Your brain works on the project that you're busy with, and I think that's extremely important, you know. And that's one thing I've taught my son as well is, you know, do what you need to do, focus on your schoolwork, work hard, but you need to find that switch off. And if you're, that switch off is um, making knives, which is something which we do, you know, then do that. You know, just go in there, take the anvil and beat a piece of metal into a shape that you might be proud of, you know, and that just make, do something, create something. Absolutely. And in, in the administrative do, uh, job, you don't necessarily create as much as you want to, you know, I'm not, I'm talking about things That's people true. will actually have after you pass on. I mean, when I was a chef, you know, we were cooking and you were creating and all those things. And then you stop doing that and you, you miss that. You know, so, so I'm very I'm assuming that those knives go to good use in your kitchen, uh, bringing the chef skills back into action when you get home. 
Strangely enough, I've never made myself a knife. Every time I make a knife, uh, it's either my son or friends of mine or everybody, you know, takes it over because it's theirs now, you know. But I don't, I don't mind, you know. I'm, I'm of the opinion that if I've made one, I can make another one. So that doesn't faze me. <laughs> well, I hope your wife then still enjoys the benefits of the chef skills. Though. Oh, absolutely. No, she despises cooking. She chose well. <laughs> <laughs> Very strategic. I love it. I absolutely love see, it. I hate doing dishes. So, you know, we, we actually complement each other quite nicely. Wonderful. Good trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lastly, Charles, what advice would you have for other role players and leaders in our industry right now? Uh, I, you know, we, everybody's feeling really despondent, of course. It's been a few months. Um, what advice would you have for them right now? Quite honestly, brace yourself. The difficult part still to come. You know what we've been in. We've been on a very bad downward slope. Yeah, it's 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 been bad the last seven months, but it's been a very easy road to travel because there's nothing you could have done. All right, you, everybody, every industry in South Africa, everybody was affected the same way. The difficult part is coming now, and that's going up. And that, for me, is prepare yourself and prepare yourself to, to diversify your product because your product will not be able to sell the way you've been selling it for the last 10, 20 years. You've got to find a different way to sell your product. You've got to find a different way to package your product and get it into the market because the competition is going to be hard. I can tell you now. And as, as a venue operator, I can tell you that we are going to hit the market hard. We are going to go out there and it's, you know, to get the business because the business pool has gone from that to that very quickly. And uh, the advice would be, you know what, the difficulties are coming and they're going to be with, with us for a, a very long time. But you know what, I'm very confident that we're going to get through it as an industry, quite honestly, because we're all the same type of people. You know, all of us in this industry, when I was training staff, the first thing I used to say in, in, in the training meetings is you're either born into this industry or you're not because you're not going to teach yourself to love it. There's no way. And if you're under the impression that you are going to teach yourself to love it, the back door's open, please, it's time to move on because you're never going to teach yourself how to love this industry. And the guys like us who've been around for the, uh, the block for many decades, we know this is what we can do. I left this industry for two years and I nearly, really nearly went insane. And to the point when, the same as when I stopped smoking the first time, my wife actually came to me about after six months with a pack of cigarettes and says, guess what, you're starting again. You know, <laughs> so... After, you know, leaving the industry for a couple of years, my wife said, well, buy a restaurant or do something because you're going back into hospitality. And <laughs> that's just who we are. And it's never going to change, you know. And that, that tells me that we are going to get through this. We are absolutely going to get through this, but we're going to have to be creative. We're going to have to work hard. And we are going to have to work differently, completely differently. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. I think you are... It was great getting to know you, um, and I'm sure the industry will really enjoy this conversation that we've had and getting to know you, your leadership, your diversification, your thoughts on diversification, your empathy for all the people within the industry, and, and the insights and the inspiration that you have for the future. I think it will be really beneficial to everybody, all our members and everybody and all the stakeholders in the industry. So thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed this platform. Wonderful. You know, we appreciate your support to the industry and uh, we wish to continue the conversation. So to those of you that have been watching, thank you for watching and thank you for listening in. Um, we're coming to the end of our Agile Leadership Series before we start the next series, which you'll also be quite interested in, continuing to get delve deeper into the industry to connect everyone and to collaborate. So we will be sure to keep you inspired, to support you and assist you in your journey ahead in the exhibition and events industry. I'm Progeny Papa, the chairperson of the